Thank you, Green, for sharing your story. Please pray with me. Father, we don't take your word lightly. We don't consider you a source. We consider you the source. We understand that on any given issue, there might be two opinions. We have our thoughts, but when our thoughts disagree with yours, we're wrong. And so we look at your word this morning because we understand that your word, you are the source of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. He didn't say, I tell the truth. He said, I am the very embodiment of truth. And so, Lord, we look to your word now. Give us insight. Give us discernment. Give us wisdom, we ask. And we'll give you thanks now for doing that. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a godly man who uh, bought a house, and he bought a house in, in a floodplain. He knew that, but he was a godly man, and he trusted God to protect him in all circumstances, and God did. <clears throat> As the years went by, floods would come and go. This one particular year, a flood came, and the floodwaters came up, came up, came up, came up, and pretty soon filled the first floor of his house. So he went up to the second floor, and the floodwaters kept coming. So he went up to the second floor of the house, and the floodwaters kept coming. And he, now he finds himself on the roof. He finds himself on the roof, and a guy comes along in a rowboat, and he said, hey, you know, you want me to give you a, a ride out of here? And he said, sure, but I don't need it. Thanks for offering. He said, I've prayed to my God and my God will rescue me. Well, now the water's coming up and now it's above the rooftop and it's up to his neck and another bigger boat comes by and same thing. The man says, I'm good. I ask God, God will rescue me. Well, now the water's over his head. Now he's treading water and a helicopter comes and they drop a line and they say, hey, grab a hold. And he said, no, thank you. My God, I've prayed to my God and my God will rescue me. Well, the man dies. Now he's before the Lord and he said, Lord, I thought you were gonna rescue me. And the Lord said, I sent two boats and a helicopter. What more do you want? <laughs> Sometimes I find myself and you found yourself drowning in sorrows, drowning in difficult circumstances, drowning in a sorry situation and you cry out and I cry out to God. God, where are you? Rescue me from this. And sometimes God's answer is, I've already sent you the answers. They're in that book that's on your shelf that's collecting dust. Go open it up and search for it and you will find your answers. You see, we want an immediate answer from God and God is saying, I've already answered your questions. I've already given you many of the answers. You want me to answer your way, but I'm going to answer my way. This morning, we're looking at wisdom, the right application of wisdom. And what I want you to realize is there are two sources of wisdom that James is going to point out. We're in the book of James. If you would, open up your Bibles to the book of James. It's in the, towards the end of your New Testament. You will find it. The book of Hebrews is pretty easy to find. It's right after Hebrews, the book of James. As you know, it's before uh, Revelation. Go to James chapter 3. and We're going to begin in verse 13 today. You also have a handout. Pull that out because you'll want to write a few things down. When you come here, expect for you to bring your Bibles so that you can take it home and, and be reminded of what we talked about today and put it into use during the week. That's where God's, God's Word makes a difference, not just in hearing, but in doing it. Please read along with me, if you will. James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show it by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, 
do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder in every evil thing. Ah, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What I want you to notice first is there's a demand for wisdom. In verse 13, James is putting everyone to the test in the church and he's saying, all right, who among you is wise? And I can imagine hands going up saying, I'm wise. I'm wise. I, I, bet I go five Bible studies, 10 Bible studies a week. I'm wise. And he's saying, prove it. He's calling them account to prove that they are wise. Let him show it by his good behavior, his deeds, <clears throat> the gentleness of wisdom. What I want you to realize is probably then like we have today, we have people who say, I have PhD, I have this degree, I have that degree. And they can wax eloquent for hours, but they may not be wise. We tend to think that they're wise and God said, maybe not, because there's only one source of wisdom. The question on the table is just what is wisdom? And so to get that, keep a finger here because we're coming back. Go to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, as Solomon is writing to his son about wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Are you there? My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver, and search for her as for hidden treasures. Then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And so what I want you to see here are there's two important elements to wisdom. It is knowledge and understanding. When we have knowledge, and understanding, and we apply it correctly, that's a wise action. That is wisdom in action. And so if you have knowledge and you marry it to understanding, they will birth wisdom. And so just knowledge is not enough. Just understanding's not enough. It's wisdom. You may go to the doctor and the doctor writes out a prescription for you and tells you what you need to do, when you need to take it, and how often. And so he gives you knowledge. Now you have understanding. This is what's wrong with me. I take these pills and I do these things. And now I have understanding on how I'm going to get well. And so I have knowledge of understanding. And when I apply that and I follow what the doctor said, now I have a wise application and I get to where I need to be. Does that make sense to you all? And so knowledge is not wisdom. It's the right application and understanding of knowledge that creates wisdom and it, cre and it means that it takes action. Why would I wanna pursue this? And I want you to see that in here, that he's saying that you have to dig for it. Verse four in Proverbs two, if you seek her as silver, God has not put wisdom on the surface, just like he has not put in great treasure on, sur on the surface of the earth. If you want great treasure, you have to dig for it. If you want diamonds or gold or silver, you must dig for it, you must search for it, you must concentrate on it. It's the same with wisdom. 
You must search for it. God is not going to put it on the surface. It is something that he wants you to seek it. And when you seek it, earnestly, you'll find it. Why would I want wisdom? Well, I want you to look at verse 7 of chapter 2. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, those who are following what he says. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. Do you want God as your shield? I think you do. There's many people, many people in churches today, they don't walk with God. Oh, they proclaim his name and they talk about him and they talk God's stuff, but they don't obey him. You're not walking under the protection of God and you're taking, well, you're ripping yourself off. If you want his protection, he expects for you to dig for wisdom and obey him. He will guard your path. I want to read to you something that impacted uh, Patty and me as we were reading it. And it was from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. But it was in the New Living Testament. So uh, I want to read those words to you. An advantage of wisdom. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years. And your life will be satisfying. How many people do you know that are living satisfying lives? And as I think of satisfying, Patty and I talk a lot about this. Satisfying would be a level in, in my mind above contentment. I don't see many people who are content today. Striving for more, searching for more, buying more. Never content. But if you do reach a level of containment, it might be like having a really good meal and you say, I'm content. I could eat more, but I'm content. But if you have eaten as much as you want and you are at a higher level above contentment, you would say, I'm satisfied. I don't need anything more. I don't want anything more. I am completely satisfied. That's the life that God says he'll give you and me. Seek wisdom. Follow him. Obey him. Don't just show up at church. Don't just read your Bible. Apply it. Apply what you learn. Patty and I have talked about this many times. With this many churches in the villages, you think this would be maybe a little different place than it is. And it's not just here. But too many of us are not challenged enough what we really want is we really want a satisfying life. And that comes from walking with God. Hearing his word, searching for wisdom in his word, and obeying it. It's searching for what God says on every issue of life. And then obeying it. So there's a demand for wisdom. And there's a reason why God wants you to live in wisdom. He wants you to live close to him and obey him. Now, I want you to also notice that James goes on. So go back to James chapter 3. He says, let him show this wisdom. So it's more than just saying I have wisdom. It's more than just talking. Let him show by his good behavior and his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. And so what James is saying is your good behavior, there's going to be actions, actions of compassion, actions of understanding, actions that are not judging others or critical of others, actions that, are, that would imitate the life of Jesus, grace and truth. And it's done in gentleness. I want you to hear the word humility there. Your actions are in humility. One author puts it this way. It's a humility is a yielding of myself to God. I yield myself to God. I am teachable and I'm responsive to his word. And so that humility also spills out into how we treat one another. Are we more compliant towards one another? Or are we the one that's always argumentative? Are we the one that's always saying, yeah, but. Or are we the one that's always saying, you know what I think? I got a few thoughts on this. Maybe that's not a teachable spirit. True wisdom is seen, not just heard. Write that down, because that's what he's saying. 
True wisdom is seen, not just heard. Humble, teachable people who see their unworthiness before God. When was the last time you thanked God for saving your soul, for choosing you, realizing your inadequacy? We all are inadequate. We're all unworthy. And yet he's chosen us. And so true wisdom is seen, not just heard. But James continues, and he explains to us wisdom from below. That's what I'm calling it on your handout. James goes in in verses 14 through 16. He says this, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Don't try to tell people that you're wise. You see, jealousy here would be self-promoting. How many of us have seen people who are self-promoting? They always have to be right. They always have to be the one that has a last word in an argument. And when you get into an argument, they'll get louder, talk faster, because their goal is to win, not to learn. Their goal is to have their way. Selfish ambition that he talks about, I think we could summarize that with me first. Me first. Every situation, me first. I'm most important, I'm going to get my way. That's the people he's talking about. And so James tells us here in verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant. And so lie against the truth. How many people do that today? It's a me, they're acting like me first and they're saying I'm a good Christian, but they're me first. They're self-centered. And yet when you look at Jesus' life, especially as we see it in Philippians 2, that he even laid his life down for us, humbled himself, even to the point of dying by the cross. There ain't nothing Christian in a proud person doing that. You need to know that. I'm not saying you're that person, but we know people like that. Some of them are preachers. Some of them are deacons. Some of them are just people sitting in the pew. They're everywhere. James goes on in verse 15. This wisdom that is selfish ambition, which is bitter jealousy, this wisdom, verse 15, is not that which comes down from above. Make no mistake. And then he tells us it's earthly, natural, and demonic. He gives us three sources of that wisdom. And so he tells us right here that that wisdom is earthly. It's not of heaven, it's of earth, meaning that it is not worthy. The word that he uses here uh, in natural is soulish. It's from the soul. It's from the soul or the flesh, which means it's everything of man, nothing of God. And then he gets right down to it. It's demonic. This kind of wisdom is from hell. That's what he's saying. And we see that every place today in our world. You see, we have people that uh, we see this kind of wisdom in our politics. Sometimes you see it in churches. But you see this kind of unruly wisdom that is earthly wisdom. It's a me first. I'm going to benefit from you. Uh, what can you do for me to benefit me? That kind of wisdom. That's earthly wisdom. And what we're seeing today is seeing PhDs around the world lying to us, even in our own country. Men and women who are greatly educated and smart as can be. But they're unwise. What does God call an unwise person? Anybody know? He calls them a fool. And so we have many smart, foolish people. Uh, some of those people are trying to tell us that God didn't create the earth and the heavens, that it came out of a great explosion. What's well, foolishness? It's foolishness to God and it's foolishness to us. We're now taught, have PhDs telling us about children. They should have the rights to choose their own gender. So, well, I think that was kind of established when you were born. There's many issues out there. The fruit of it is all chaos. Look at verse 16. 
For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. That's the result of this false wisdom. So how do you know if it's earthly wisdom? There's going to be exactly what he says. There's going to be disorder and every evil thing. And so the word that he uses for disorder here means unruliness. It does not, it's opposition to any kind of authority. Don't we see that everywhere today? There's an opposition to any kind of authority, unruliness. And that's where you start to see, okay, that's earthly wisdom because it is producing disorder. It's producing anger. It's producing chaos. That is not from God. As a matter of fact, the wisdom that people are professing, God actively stands against and will thwart it. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 1.20. Where is the wise man, Paul asks? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? They come up with a way that they think is wise and God is going to stand against it, thwart it, twist it, and turn it to be foolish. They're standing against God and they can't stand against him. This is not where we want to be, but this is what we see, isn't it? Don't we see this kind of wisdom in our world today? That's earthly wisdom and it's wisdom from hell. Proverbs 14, 12 tells us this. There is a way that seems right to man. Many of you could finish this statement. There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. We think we have this figured out. Earthly wisdom. And it leads to death. And so the wisdom from below is that we can see it. We see the source of it. And we see the result of it. But what about wisdom from above? And that's where James turns next in verse 17. Read along with me, if you will, in verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And so this wisdom from above, first of all, is peacemaking. Doesn't build strife. It isn't me first. It isn't seeking my agenda. It's peaceful. It makes peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. It's gentle, it's humble, it accepts correction, especially when it comes from the Bible. It accepts correction, it yields to God. It is reasonable. Somebody who is reasonable is somebody who is compliant. Well, that makes sense, the Bible says that. I don't agree with that, but I think we can work with this. That's a person that is reasonable. Full of mercy, not somebody that's looking to judge others, but someone who is full of mercy. I heard somebody, a pastor that I respect very much recently say that if you find someone who cannot forgive and they say things like, I won't forgive, I can't forget, I never will forgive. He said, you better check that person's salvation because they're not saved. That's a pretty bold statement. I don't know if it's right. He is making a very bold statement though that Jesus said that you must forgive. You must forgive or you won't be forgiven. And so forgiveness is at the very essence of who God is. That's one of his characteristics is to forgive like he forgave us. So this pastor is saying, if they've never received the forgiveness of God for them, how can they possibly give it to others? Mercy. Wisdom from above is merciful. This is what we strive to be, is to use that kind of wisdom so that these words would express who we are. And once again, verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure. It's unmixed. It is completely unmixed. It is pure. It is holy. It is set aside for God's use. Then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, meaning there's good results that come from it. It's unwavering. It's steadfast on God's word. And it's without hypocrisy. There's no masks here. There's no deception here. There's no, I say this, but I do that. This kind of wisdom is consistent. This is the way you are wherever you are. 
One of the questions that we, not questions, but we told our kids years ago, uh, if you see a different side of me at church than you see at home, I want you to tell me because kids are going to see it right away. And we don't want that hypocrisy. One, that's not good for our testimony, but it's our own kids that we really want to walk with the Lord. If they see hypocrisy, they're going to discount the whole thing. And so will your friends and those people around you. Be real. We're not perfect people, but let's be people who love. Let's be people who have this kind of wisdom. And that's what James is challenging us to do. And so we have eight characteristics there that show us what true, biblical, godly wisdom looks like. So how do we apply that? James turns to that in verse 18. In verse 18, he says, And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Be a peacemaker. What I want you to see here is how we're going to get godly wisdom. There's three steps. One is to fear God. Fear God is what the Bible tells us. Listen to what Proverbs 9.10 says. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so it begins with a fear of the Lord. Do you have a fear of God? Do you take Him seriously? Do you take Him seriously that He sees everything you do, that He hears everything you say, that He knows every thought, and or are we hypocrites acting one way and acting another way in front of the right people? You cannot have an appropriate fear of God if you've never trusted him. Do you, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your savior? Have you come to a point in your life where you say, God, this starts with me fearing you enough to say, I know that I'm wrong. I know that I've done wrong things and I know that Jesus paid it all for me. And so I'm trusting in Christ alone as the only way to heaven. But I don't only get heaven I get the abundant life right now. So it's not just thinking future, it's thinking now. For eternal life is a quality of life that you have right now. And so when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, when we say, you are my Lord, my Savior, forgive me of my sins, then we become a child of God. And the Holy Spirit enters into us. And now we have capability to understand his word and to do the things that he asks us to do. Isn't it wonderful that he not only asks us to do things, but he empowers us to carry them out? Somebody could say amen on that. It's God's truth, not mine. And so we take him seriously. Let me give you just an illustration of that. We tend to live our lives a little different on Sunday than Monday. And so think of it this way. You might be driving down 75 and maybe you're driving down 75 and you're doing 85. Maybe you're doing 90 mile an hour because you're in a hurry, you're late for an appointment. And so you're driving down there 90 miles an hour and you see up ahead, a state trooper gets onto the highway. What's the first thing you do? Look at your speedometer. Ooh. Lift that foot off, maybe even touch the brake, tap the brake a little bit. And as long as he's there, you're living in his presence, right? And you're living in the fear that what he could do to you. Now what happens after he exits off? We go right back to where we were, don't we? I want you to live life not like God is some distant being because he's not. Live your life in the presence of God. He's with you constantly. Take him seriously. That's the first step. Fear God. Take him seriously. The second step is develop intimacy with the Lord. That's a daily intimate relationship with him. Why? Colossians 2.3 says this. Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus has the answer to every question you have and that I have. He has all the answers. And I don't know about you, but I like hanging around people who have all the answers. I mean, really have all the answers, not think they have all the answers. 
And Jesus does. He has all the answers. So I want to develop an intimate relationship with him. How do I do that? I follow his commands to come to me. We've talked about that before. Come to him is coming to him in confession and saying, I'm trusting in you as the only way to heaven. Not only come to him, but his second command is abide in me. Hang out with me. Live with me. Develop that intimate relationship with me. And then his third command is follow me. You follow after him daily. This is where the abundant life is that we really want. I've come to the realization, I hope you have too, that when I follow God, I'm actually acting in my own best self-interest. We tend to say, oh, God is so hard to live up to. Well, it is, but he empowers us to do it and he wants us to be where he designed us to be because he has a plan for your life. And so we not only uh, do we come to him, we abide in him, we follow him. But what I find many times is we can be in multiple Bible studies during the week and have no change in our life. We walk out of that and it's just like I audited a class at college. I can audit that class and walk out and it's like, well, I was there. I showed up. Did it have any change in my life? No. That is not what God wants for us. What God wants for you and what he wants for me is for us to not audit the Bible, but to live it. That's why I wrote it. That's why I gave it to you. Because he wants the best life for you. He wants better things for us than we want for ourselves. Third, ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom. James 1.5, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. God wants to give you wisdom. Find out what God says on a matter and then do it. That's where you're going to find wisdom. So how are we going to apply this? Here's my challenge to you. Read a chapter of Proverbs. Start there. Read a chapter of Proverbs a day. There's 31 Proverbs. It'll take you through the month. But read one proverb a day and then sit there and think about it. What stuck out to me today? And write that down. And then think about that one thing during the day. Allow God's word to infiltrate you. Meditate on it. What does that mean? Did it say this? Well, it didn't say that. Why did he pick that word? What is this showing me? How would this look in my life? And they close with this short story of what wisdom looks like. It's been maybe six or seven, maybe eight years ago. And we were having a conversation in the boardroom here. And the conversation was something like this. We were talking about the problem we would have because we had an even number of board members. And so we had this long drawn out conversation about, well, what if we vote for, for, and for against? We're gonna have a stalemate. What are we gonna do? We can't possibly have that. We have to add another member. So we need more human help so that we can have that human help on this board so that we can make a decision. And that'll be the answer. Are you all buying into that? I hope not. Because it's not gonna resolve it. That's man's wisdom. Man's wisdom says you have to have another man or another woman there to break the tie. We talked about this for longer than I want to think about. Finally, one of our elders, a godly man, his name was Jim. He was a retired pastor. He was a quiet man who did more listening than he did talking. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, he said, I don't think that's the answer. He said, the truth is, if we have a stalemate and we're four for something and four against, he said, that's not our problem. Our problem is we don't have the Spirit's approval on this. We're divided. What we need is we need to go back to our knees and seek God's wisdom. You know, he was right. And so I ask you, where do you have confusion in your life? Where do you have angst? 
Where do you have those areas of your life where you maybe have not forgiven someone? Maybe it's someone in your life that you say, I'll never forgive them. Go to God's word. See what he says. Maybe there's a decision that you have to make. Go to God, see what he says about it, and then obey it. He'll give you peace that you'll never find in this world. Let's pray. Father, help us to be men and women who have godly wisdom, not earthly wisdom. Help us to be people. Strengthen us, Lord. Give us that wisdom that we desperately need because there's a desperate need for wisdom, godly wisdom on this earth. We need it in our families. We need it in our church. And Lord, while some may say they have it figured out and they arrogantly talk about that they have it figured out, they don't. At least we'll know that. Help us to follow you. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.